Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Australian Herpetological Society's September meeting. Uh, Glenn Shea sends his apologies tonight. He'll be uh, spending a few weeks working at the Natural History Museum over in London. Um, we also received news this month that uh, Eric Pianca had passed away. Um, Eric, uh, we were fortunate enough to have come out to Australia in 2017. I know many of you here were able to attend uh, uh, the night that he put on. It was, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's an amazing guy. And, uh, we'll, I'm sure, be very sadly missed. Um, Eli, how do you pronounce his surname? Beery. Beery, okay. Um, is a master's student uh, at the University of New South Wales, uh, working with Jody Rowley, originally from Michigan. Uh, Eli will be discussing tonight his work on salamanders. Um, next month, we're going to have Eddie Mills, who's up the back there. Um, <laughs> Eddie, what, what will you be speaking on? The turtles of where? Western North America. Washington State. Washington State. Okay. Um, if you can give us some details that we can put online to start promoting that, that'd be good. Um, the uh, the November meeting uh, will be another careers night. We've had I think two of those in the past. Um, it'll be heavily promoted. We'll be getting a whole bunch of people um, along from various sectors. Uh, we'll have someone from academia. Uh, Dane is going to be uh, representing academia and talking about his journey and what it's, what's involved in, uh, in working day to day in that field. Uh, Andrew Melrose is going to be talking about uh, reptile demonstrations and um, uh, dealing with the public. Uh, we'll have a vet nurse coming along, uh, someone from Taronga Zoo. We're just trying to figure out who that will be at this stage. And um, I think we've got someone else lined up. So that'll be for November. That should be a big one. They're always really, um, really well attended. Um, all right, we'll, uh, we'll get on with the show tonight and I'll hand over to Eli to talk about his work on salamanders. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. Uh, like Chris said, I'm Eli and I'm a master's student at UNSW. I'm studying frogs here, frogs in bushfire. Um, yeah, but tonight I will not be speaking about frogs, I'll be talking about salamanders. And um, I'm told that this country is lacking in salamanders, which is exciting for me because it means that I can basically say whatever I want and you guys have to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, this is just some of my, my salamander work from, from back home in Michigan. So yeah, I'm from the great state of Michigan. Um, I grew up in the lower peninsula here, but went to uni up in the upper peninsula and that's where most of the research I'm gonna talk about took place. Um, so yeah, Michigan is home to 13 species, not super diverse species, um, but the diversity we do have um, is varies a ton with morphology. Um, we've got everything from sirens, which are fully aquatic, all the way to platyodonids, which are one of those terrestrial direct developing species. Um, and then the most diversity in Michigan is the embistomatids, which are the mole salamanders. Uh, you guys might know tiger salamanders or, or spotteds. Uh, and they're really cool. They spend most of the most of the year underground. Uh, a lot of people in Michigan will say to me, like, "Oh, I didn't even know we, we had salamanders." Not just because they're so cryptic. Um, they spend a lot of the year just burrowed underground, and really, your only chance to see them is um, if you're out looking for them. They're these explosive breeders where they, they all migrate to their, their breeding ponds. Um, and people will see them sometimes that time. So yeah, we'll get into some weird salamander genetics and. Um, but before we talk about all that stuff, I'll just quickly speak about how I got into the world of salamander research. Um, so this is a species that's near and dear to my heart, the blue-spotted salamander. Their distribution is kind of the northeast US and Canada. Um, they're pretty small, like less than 14 centimeters. Um, you can see they're kind of dark blue with this like light blue speckling. And, um, so they, they spend most of their time, like other mole salamanders, underground, uh, feeding on insects, slugs, worms. And um, when winter comes, they burrow deep underground, like below the cross line, so over a meter under the soil. And then um, when the spring rains happen, they all kind of emerge in mass and migrate to their, their spring breeding pools, which is when I first kind of became acquainted with blue spotted salamanders. Um, in their breeding pools, which are usually kind of vernal temporary ponds, uh, they lay eggs, 
the eggs hatch a few, few weeks later, and then the larval settlement is metamorphosed towards the end of summer, so a couple months later, uh, at which time they migrate back to, back to the woodlands. So um, my first year of uni, which was back in 2018, I was a freshman, and um, a grad student gave me a tip that there might be salamanders migrating. So I went out with some friends like, with the hopes of maybe seeing one or two, and was shocked when I saw like literally thousands crossing the street at the same time. Um, so it was absolutely in awe and kind of fell in love immediately. And that was cool until cars started zipping by and each one was basically squishing salamanders. Um, so that was a little upsetting and I was basically just was left with a lot of questions like, you know, is this negatively impacting the population? How many are being killed? Um, so I met with my advisor who was a fish biologist, um, but she agreed to work on salamanders because they're kind of aquatic. Um, so we came up with a research plan together and um, doing, doing well salamander research is tricky because you really have to time the migration. Um, so I was basically going out every night with a head torch through March and April um, in freezing rain and snow <laughs> looking for salamanders. And when I finally saw the first one, meeting the migration had started. Of course, I didn't have cell phone service, so I had to sprint back to my car, drive back to campus, and then I had drafted an email to my whole volunteer list. Um, drove to campus, sent the email, drove back, and then just basically hoped that some volunteers would show up. But within a couple hours, in the freezing rain, I had over 20 volunteers. Um, so then the, the migration lasted five more nights, and we tagged salamanders, weighed, measured, photographed. Ended up being a ton of fun, uh, saw some cool things. And the way we estimated how many salamanders were being killed by cars was we just tagged a, a subset of the population, basically. Um, and then of the salamanders we tagged, we determined how many of those were hit by cars. How, how have you tagged them? So this here is a, a pit tag. It's just like a little glass tag that has like a um, identification number. And you can scan that with a reader. Um, and initially, that, we thought that worked pretty well until we realized if a car is running over salamanders, it's probably crushing a pit tag. Um, so after the first night, we had that realization and then pivoted to uh, what's called VIE, which is just like a fluorescent dye that you inject under um, the salamander skin. And what's nice about that is, yeah, you can see it glowing there, is if you have a, a bucket full of dead salamanders, you just shine a black light over them and you can easily tell which ones have been tagged. Um, and it's cool because now if you go to Marquette and watch the migration, you can still see some that kind of have their little tattoo. <laughs> Um, so here's the results, uh, almost 430 were killed by vehicles that year, over five nights. Is that um, percentage? Basically, basically the same amount of males and females. Kind of interesting that um, towards the, the, the first three nights was, were mostly males, and then later in the month when there was kind of a second wave of migration, it was mostly females. Um, so it's interesting for what it's worth. And out of the 120 we tagged, over 10%. Um, were killed by cars. And there was a model that showed in systematics, if you have that level of mortality, it'll lead to a potential population decline. Um, so we figured that it probably warranted mitigation. Um, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here, talking to a herb group about why we should care. <laughs> but when I brought this to the city saying, I think we should close the road, uh, I was definitely met with a lot of skepticism. Um, and of course, amphibians are, are indicator species, so biologists can kind of use them as a baseline uh, to measure overall ecosystem health. So that was one of my big talking points. Um, and then you always hear, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the emphasis in conservation is on threatened and endangered species. Um, and people would ask me, like, are, well, are they threatened? And the answer is no. They're actually really common, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't still be um, conserving them. We, we want to keep our common species common. Um, sometimes because they're common, so um, um, in, in the Northeast U.S. woodlands, uh, salamanders actually account for the most vertebrate biomass of any group of animals. And so that means that they're prey to everything. They're basically the gummy bears of the woodlands, foxes eat them, ravens eat them, um, snakes, other amphibians. And they're also, they also eat a ton of insects, um, including mosquito larvae, so that has implications for human health. Um, and then natural heritage, my last point, is just, I think it's, it's pretty cool to see a community come together to, to protect nature. 
um, are kind of special species that occurs around them. So yeah, I brought this to the city and went to a couple of city council meetings and spoke. Um, and like I said, people initially kind of crumbled about the road closing. But um, eventually, yeah, the city unanimously voted to close the road, which is cool. And um, when the road closure happened, it got kind of a lot of local press. So people suddenly, people that you know didn't even know salamanders existed in Marquette were excited about them. And um, if you went out on a night that the salamanders were moving, there'd be 30 or 40 people out with, with head torches kind of watching the salamanders. Um, and my old advisor, Jill Leonard, now has a, a little citizen science project where she asks salamander watchers to kind of fill out a data sheet and has a whole, a whole uh, salamander count. So that's, that's cool and hopefully produces some cool data. Um, yeah, and the city really kind of like took this and ran with it, which is, I, I think it's just a cool example of um, a group of animals that, you know, normally, sorry, you can't, <laughs> can't read the events there, but um, it's a group of animals that normally aren't celebrated. Um, it just shows that this community is like totally embracing them. And um, I guess they had a, a poetry reading with salamanders and a salamander art competition, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't make it to the first annual Salamander Days event I was traveling, but hopefully hopefully soon. And the, the local brewery even has a Salamander beer now, which I hear is pretty good. I haven't sampled, but um, hopefully a, a kind friend will, will mail me some. <laughs> so yeah, the road closure's been a great short-term solution, um, but obviously the road closure itself is inconvenient, so we're looking for longer term solutions and these, these kind of under the road tunnels or eco passes uh, have proven to be really effective in, in other circumstances. So that's something we're exploring. Um, and in the US now there's actually a new infrastructure bill that allocates a lot of money for wildlife crossings. Um, so potentially there's some funding for it. And then this is a, kind of a weird thing, but in the course of the research, I noticed these these female blue, blue spotted salamanders that were just way larger than like three times the size of all the other salamanders. Um, and they're way outside the range of another salamander that, that they would maybe resemble, like a Jefferson's or smallmouth. Um, so I, I kind of had a hunch that they might be this unisexual population that has been seen in other states. So uh, I reached out to this amphibian geneticist who's, I'm, I'm going to play a video of his um, and mailed him some. And it turns out they were the upper peninsula's. Uh, first population of, of unisexual salamanders. Is that they've got both sexes? What's that? Unisexual, unisexual what's right? that? Sex. He'll, he'll explain it a bit. <laughs> humans have such a perception of reproduction that's human-centric. Yes, you're right. Like, and when that's challenged, it really throws folks for a loop to think of something that doesn't need its own males, but crosses these species boundaries in order to obtain reproductive material. But what does the world look like with no males or clonal reproduction? What does that mean uh, from the perspective of these two little aliens? My name is Rob Finn. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, Morris. These salamanders are unbelievable. They're an all-female group of salamanders that can steal sperm from males of other species. My name is Katie Greenwald. I am an associate professor at Eastern Michigan University in Essilia, Michigan. When you think about it, a lineage that's all made up of females can actually grow twice as fast as a lineage that has both males and females. Numbers wise, that lineage should eventually swamp out and compete and beat a lineage that has evolved to have both males and females. We sometimes call this the twofold cost of males. It costs to make males, and males, particular resources that can be used for females. It's still relatively mysterious why the sex evolved and how it's been maintained for so long across so many different species across the tree fly. The reason that we're so interested in these unisexual and mixed salamanders is that they are virtually able to sort of flip flop between sexual and asexual reproduction. These various options in terms of how these offspring are produced and their size become completely globally unique, and it makes the system a really excellent one to look at when sexual reproduction is adaptive versus when asexual reproduction is adaptive. there by a male of a different species. 
what makes these animals separate and distinct and interesting is the rate at which those other units you know, sneak into the offspring. So, you know, typical sexually reproducing organisms, we're having you know, one set of their DNA, a set of chromosomes from mom, one set from dad. And so all of us have two sets of chromosomes. The unisexual salivators, we do sometimes get them with two sets but it's much more common for them to have three or four sets. And we sometimes even find them with five. Five tends to be about where they maxed out. Ohio and Indiana are kind of the epicenter of craziness for the complex because there are actually five different sexual species that they can reproduce with, that they can breed with the males and then potentially incorporate those males' DNA. It's not only that they have these different potential outcomes, but that even within a single clutch of eggs where when they're all siblings, all sisters, you may have actually different types of salamanders being produced. It's amazing that they have this scenario of having multiple genomes, but I think what puts it into perspective is how distantly related these species are that are sharing this genetic information. If we were to take a sample of my blood and I had a set of chromosomes from my mother, from my father, but in addition, a whole set from the gorilla, that's the type of evolutionary divergence between these salamanders that I would be a fully functioning, normal human being. Mm-hmm. 
genes play that sound in or their genetic ways. People argue about what a species is. And these animals are so far from that argument that it's, it's not worth really having. Super weird, right? Um, yeah, so I think finding out that we had a, a unisexual population just kind of emphasized the need to conserve this group. Um, and I won't get the, the genetics of parthenogenesis mostly because I don't really understand it. But um, yeah, really cool. And what, what I find really interesting is we don't even have most of the species that would be there to hybridize. That, that, um, with, with the unisexuals, yet they contain the DNA from those other species. So likely, um, they're almost a relic of a species that used to be in Michigan, and they almost become like a DNA reservoir of, of species that are now extirpated from the state, which, which I find really fascinating. Um, so that was cool. And then, um, this is a kind of a random side note, but um, in every, every range map of tiger salamanders, um, another another mole salamander species, you'll see just a little dot in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, and I always wondered what that little dot was. It was kind of just like a disjunct population. Um, so you know, I asked around and, and couldn't really find out much about it. And eventually stumbled on a, a paper from the 1950s from Michigan State University, um, where some guy collected a handful of tiger salamanders from this lake, but they were almost like axolotls where they were completely neotenic and never metamorphosed um, into the, the adult terrestrial fish. <coughs> so they were basically fully fun functional, sexual, sexually mature salamanders still in the larval state, um, which is what neoteny is. And uh, I kind of made it my mission. That there hadn't been anything published on them since the 50s or 60s. Um, so I wanted to first of all see if they were still there, and second of all see try to determine why they're neotenic, um, see if I could induce them in metamorphosis with thyroid hormone or something. Um, so I spent basically an entire summer doing, uh, as you can see, grilling field work in my friend's boat. <laughs> but um, we did some like some free diving and, and set a bunch of traps like you saw in the video. Um, and it was, yeah, we, we didn't find any, so um, I, I, I'd have to guess that the Upper Peninsula is, is probably free of, of tiger salamanders these days. Um, but you never know, it, it's a big lake and maybe they're in there somewhere. So someday, someday I'd like to get back and, and keep looking. Um, and then this was another cool byproduct of the research. I, I surveyed a few dozen uh, spotted salamanders. So this is another species, and Andrusoma maculatum. Um, a few dozen of their breeding pools and oh, for, for a few years. And um, of the few dozen, only one of them I consistently found albinos, um, I think three years in a row I found albino salamanders in this one little pool. Um, so it's really interesting that, and this is the first case of albinism in a uh, mole salamander in Michigan. Um, but really interesting that that gene could persist in this little population. And um, if I had to guess why, I'd say they're a fossorial species that spends most of their time underground, so they're not really, um, you know, they're not being faced with the, the selection pressure of UV radiation and visual, visual predators, um, which is cool. I mean, it, it looked just so bizarre. So, and then this is just more, more um, reason to, to conserve the salamanders we have. Um, we know about chytrid fungus in Australia and what it's doing in our frogs. Um, there's another type of chytrid fungus that infects salamanders uh, called bee cell, and it's absolutely wiped out salamanders in Europe. And it hasn't made it to the United States yet, but as you can see in that map, uh, the, the vast majority of salamander diversity is, is in the US. Um, so it, it, it's really like a ticking time bomb. A lot of people say it's just a matter of time before it gets there, and we see a lot of population cra crashes. Um, and like frogs, they're just sensitive to environmental change, so all sorts of pollution and habitat loss. Um, so yeah, salamanders are important, and we should protect them. Um, and then, yeah, I'm really grateful for, for all the funding I got and all the support in, in my university. And I will open it up for questions. Hmm. Thanks, guys.
That, that newspaper clipping where it said student stop the road, is that you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and how, how many days would the road be shut then? Uh, it's about a month. So oh, it's about a month. Because you yeah. said it's usually five days or something. Yeah, so it's just so tough to predict when the migration is actually going to occur. Um, so they kind of, th there's not many businesses or anything along the road. So it, it's. So they close it now before it even starts? Yes, right. Okay, you don't yeah. have to wait. Yeah, which would be great to start the eco passes so they could just yeah. have their own. That's pretty cool. Yeah. With the walkways underneath the Salamins now, are you going to be doing any research to see? Yeah, good question. I think my, my old advisor, if they do build the eco passes, well, that's something she would be super into. So, yeah, it, there's been some studies like in other states where they've tested it out, and it seems like um, in a similar species, the same genus, I think they had like over 90% of the salamanders successfully navigated, which means 10% didn't, which isn't much better than our, our road mortality. So, yeah, it's worth considering. I, um, I appear to be quite robust for handling up he's wearing gloves, so they easy to yeah. so they don't get affected by it. They, they are sensitive, so I mean definitely wash up your hands with just, just water and, and dirt. Um, and then yeah, they, but they are they are generally pretty hardy. Um, yeah. I would say if you're handling them more for than just a couple of minutes, wear gloves. So like with the tagging and stuff, we, we wore gloves. That, the tiger salamander, yeah. you said that one doesn't change. It's like an axolotl. So usually they do, but in this lake, in this instance, for whatever reason, they, they stayed in that, that larval stage. Okay. Um, but there are those um, tiger salamanders still in other other lakes or ponds? Yeah, in, in, lower, in the lower peninsula they are, yeah. And this is, this is what the tiger salamander looks like after, after it's metamorphs. And you did the spotted one at the bottom there. Yeah, so spotted and, and then blue spotted salamander was the one that was crossing the road. Are the conditions much different where the tiger salamanders stay in their larval state compared to where they walk? Yeah, that's a good question. So that whole area was logged. Um, yeah, so it, it, it might be that the habitat was so degraded that they, for whatever reason, had the phenotypic plasticity where they could just stay in, in the larval state. So that's one theory. Yeah, good question. With the unisexual individuals, is it like just one origin of that, or are there repeated origins? Like I don't know much about the distribution, good, but good I'm just question. curious. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, if it's evolved multiple times or, or not. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. But I, I think it, I, I want to say it's one lineage. Yeah, right. They, as they incorporate other male species DNA, then it. So how do they get the other species DNA? So if, 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 how amphibians breed is a male basically just drops a it's called a spermatophore, which is just yeah. a packet of sperm. And a female just like walks over it and okay. it physically picks it up. Um, so in theory, that could be a, a, a male of another species in the same genus, and one of these unisexual females okay. um, just picks up this ground for it. With the breeding of the unisexual individuals, how did they pair them? Was it with males from the same ponds and then different ponds? I think so, yeah. And I don't know how much you know about that research, but are they trialing different species from the same? I think they are, yeah. So in that particular study, it was blue spotted salamanders and, and Jeffersons as well, which are like two local species. Crazy. How are the mud puppies doing? Mud puppies, <laughs> oh, good question. So they, they used to be really common throughout Michigan. Um, and in the Great Lakes, there's an invasive species, the sea lamprey, uh, that got in when they, they introduced um, shipping into the Great Lakes, and they opened up a bunch of canals. Um, and sea lampers have been pretty devastating for like the fish stock, the fishing game fish like Lake Charles and Whitefish. Yeah. So they, they've been pumping lampersides into a lot of the, into the lakes and like the, the tributaries where the sea lampers breed. And lampersides don't affect fish, but it does absolutely decimate mud puppies. Um, so yeah, we get like, it, it, they're, they're pretty rare now actually, which is, is pretty sad because they used to be such a common species. So the mud puppies are top salamanders, is it? Yeah, it's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the lamp is. Yeah, pretty cool species. Mm. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank oh, you. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, um, earlier in your talk, I was just going to comment. You said about how they call things common. And so I was just saying, there's now, right. there's now a push across sort of worldwide to make sure that no 
animals, their common names are called common something. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Because it, um, there's all this, so yeah, it's, all, yeah. it's a total misconception. Yeah. yeah. Passenger pind- uh, pigeon syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah so everywhere, so you don't care about them. And then, so yeah, so I just want to point out that was a good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank Thanks. you. Yeah.